How good is the data in Canada on uh, particularly wealthy immigrants? There was good data collected by the federal government when we had our investor program, our business immigration program. But in terms of the housing market, uh, we really have very poor data. In fact, we used to have better data 20 years ago, but the government actually shut down uh, part of the data collection. Why they, do you think that is? Um, either it was too much of a hassle or they actually didn't want people to know the national origins of buyers in the housing market. Why would you not want to know that information? Well, this has been uh, a province, British Columbia in Canada, that has been wide open to investment across the Pacific. I would say since 1986 when we had a World's Fair here and the second leg of the business immigration program, the investor program, also launched in 1986 and these were both, both the fair and the program were real efforts to draw in investment and immigration as well uh, from East Asia. And that has been uh, a continuing process. Uh, indeed, even when we had a social democratic provincial government, that didn't change. So there are constantly trade missions to China. Uh, we have got a, a sister city arrangement with Guangzhou, sister province arrangement with Guangdong, and so, and so it goes on. There's been an incredible reaching out. And the whole the whole history here has been one of not wanting to do anything that would jeopardize those relations. And if data uh, has um, inconvenient truths, then that data is not available. There is that sense in New Zealand that we don't want to upset the Chinese. And in fact, mm -hmm. actually um, talking about Chinese money mm -hmm. um, raises racial issues. Was that the Canadian experience as well? It has been, and it's been one way of really shutting down any adult discussion. Um, as soon as issues arise about why is housing so unaffordable here, uh, why are students buying houses for $31 million, as happened two, two months ago, you, uh, you're told that's, you know, that's off bounds. Uh, I think the counter point is that it is the capital that is of interest. I mean, this is, this is a class issue, not an ethnic issue. There is a tremendous amount of capital that is flowing in here. And that, of course, has always been the case in the, in the dominions, you know, the, the white settler societies, uh, probably uh, in Australia and New Zealand, and probably here too, up to the 70s, it was British money or American money. Right now, or in the 90s, it was Japanese money. Right now, it's Chinese money. Mm. And I think the issue is much more to do with the capital flow rather than the, uh, the ethnic color of the money. Uh, if you've got no data, then the argument is there's nothing to talk about. It's all anecdote. Mm. Uh, and so you, you can see how a very kind of coherent denial is set up. Uh, in order to facilitate the continuing uh, flow of capital here, regardless of the consequences. Not a clever way to make social policy, though, or, uh, you know, or to make uh, economic policy. It's interesting that economic policy and social policy are not brought together in this sort of uh, neoliberal accounting. We only look at the market. We don't look at social impacts. Let's talk about the wealthy investors. Mm -hmm. now, you had a wealthy investor program. Yes. We still have one. Yes. Wealthy immigrants can come into New Zealand, yes. pay $10 million, start a business or whatever. Yeah. When you looked into the investor program, what did you discover? That it's a sham. Um, this, is, this was some good data that was kept by the federal government. And what it has shown uh, since at least the mid-1990s is that immigrants who come through the investor program declare a lower income in Canada than any other immigrant group, lower even than refugees. Let's talk about housing for a moment. 
because there was an argument that goes, well, there's only a few people coming in and buying at the, t at the top end of the mm -hmm. market. This isn't going to cause much of a problem. But it occurs to me that this might be one area where the trickle-down theory actually yes. might work. Yes. Uh, uh, talk to me about what the effect is of a few people buying at the top of the market. Well, one thing that we've got to put on the table right away is that one household does not equal one property. So one household entering uh, Auckland or Vancouver could well be buying two properties, one to live in, one to invest. Uh, many very wealthy people are buying three, four, half a dozen properties. So uh, this is something that we do not, of course, have firm data on, but we know is happening. So there is a multiplier effect over and above the, what may seem like a small number. Now, the second point is the, the trickle-down effect. We call it the ripple effect, that investment at the top end ripples out into the rest of the housing market because local people who would have been buying in the top end are displaced. So they move, as it were, out one ring, and then they displace the people who would have bought there. Uh, and also, of course, there are the people who are cashing out at the top end, local people who, well, I've lived in my house for 25 years. I could cash out and get over $2 million. So I will move into a nearby market and contribute to the right raising of prices there. Why are the Chinese buying in Vancouver and in London and Auckland? Uh, what, why, what's the motivation? Uh, it's not a coincidence that these are uh, English-speaking cities. They uh, are keen uh, that their children be educated in Western schools and universities. They have got confidence in due process before the law uh, in those countries. Uh, in those cities, there is invariably an existing uh, ethnic Chinese community. These all seem to be key factors. Another key factor, undoubtedly, is quality of life. That uh, we've seen images of uh, pollution uh, in China. And all of these three cities uh, that you mentioned, and we might add San Francisco, for example, uh, uh, to that list, uh, are all cities that have got decent uh, environments. In fact, you know, highly desirable environments. So these seem to be the key factors that, uh, that, that are leading to the movement. And also, those cities uh, have direct air connections back to China, because in many cases, a business remains in China. You know, your super visa guy who only has to be 30 days in New Zealand, the rest of the year he's looking after his, his cash-generating business in China. You see, that's a problem, isn't it? And what is the real benefit to an economy of someone whose business is overseas? Well, the real benefit uh, is, is certainly not in terms of the economic development uh, idea and hope that lies behind these investor programs. Uh, where there has been economic impact is in the housing market. So real estate is now the, uh, the, the biggest industry, effectively, of Vancouver in terms of tax generation and so on. Uh, home furnishings, expensive cars, uh, so the consumer side of the home. So it is very much housing uh, and housing related is where economic impact occurs. And to some extent that is favorable, but when it gets to a point that price escalation is, is making housing totally unaffordable for local people, most people would say, you know, that, that's gone too far now. So why don't they invest at home? There are some real downsides uh, to investing in China. First of all, there are not many things you can invest in. Uh, the property market is cyclic. It's going up again now, but it had a huge drop for two years. Uh, the stock exchange is like a yo-yo and lost a lot of money last year. Uh, and also, um, 
anyone wants to, you know, diversify their portfolio. Think of our pension plans, you know, you, you, you want as much diversification as possible. Uh, in addition, I think if you're wealthy in China, you can never be confident that your wealth is secure. I mean, you may, you may have made uh, political enemies. You may have made, um, taken economic shortcuts and be open to corruption charges. So there are all manner of reasons for people to diversify. And companies are doing it as well as individuals. Chinese companies are doing the same thing. So when I ask the question, why are the Chinese investing in cities like Auckland? I guess one of the answers is because they can. Yes, they can, they can indeed. They are welcomed. Mm. Um, I mean, that certainly was the case here. We really put out the welcome mat. So tell me, the 15% surtax, Yes. what sort of effect does that have? Well, this is a very new tax. Uh, it's just been in, in place for about six weeks. So uh, these are initial responses. But in the first month after the tax, which I don't think was typical because transactions were quite low, uh, prices did fall significantly. Um, that is the average price. I must be specific here. The average price fell. And this was because there were hardly any sales at the top end. So if we look at the average price, it fell. If we look at the median price, it was flat which means that people, you know, who were buying and selling houses to live in were still doing that. But those who uh, were looking at them more as an investment at the top end uh, just are holding back. Uh, we're going through what might turn out to be shock treatment, which is the 15% tax could conceivably lead to a 20% drop in house prices. Um, but what the adjustments that are occurring are that people are looking at other housing types. Uh, this is the city with by far the highest percentage of condominiums mm. in Canada. Mm. So people are looking at smaller units, townhouses, condominiums, uh, the single family or the detached house neighborhoods are being densified. Uh, so uh, a fairly small lot next door to me 33 foot wide, uh, old house torn down, new house going up, and it, it will house three different families. Uh, there'll be a three-story main house with the basement uh, being rented, and then at the bottom of the garden there's what we call a laneway house, which is a, a separate entity which will have another household. Uh, so three households, densification, of the single family dwelling. There are those who say uh, in the city itself, the era of the detached house is over. There's an argument in our country that goes, all you have to do is increase supply. We simply need to build more houses yes. and everything will be fine. What's your view about that? Well, that argument is, is prominent here, as you would expect, from the real estate industry, the development industry, who have done very, very well, of course, out of the last 30 years now of inflating prices. Uh, part of their story is that it's the fault of municipal planning, that uh, they're not able to build faster, they're not able to build more. So remove the planning constraints and, and look what we'll be able to do. Um, I think the problem with that argument is certainly they can put up condominiums and townhouses, but these are not affordable. The issue is affordable supply uh, because what is happening is that they put up a new building. A number of them are sold off plan and out of country. So uh, it's, it's a global market that is buying as well as a local market. And, and so the amount of real supply, extra supply you're introducing uh, is limited. And uh, it is unaffordable because land prices now are so high that even if the developer cuts his profit margin, he's still got to cover the costs of land in the first instance. So supply is, is, is not 
the answer, affordable supply is. And I think it does require some sort of shock treatment, uh, such as this 15% tax, to really bring prices down. The other end of that, of course, is that if wages don't come up, if a yeah. living wage doesn't yeah. come up, if we don't pay people more, then they can't. Henry Ford realised yeah. that he, you know, if he didn't lift his, um, the wages of his workers, they couldn't buy his cars. Yeah. Is that an issue in Canada? Or since it's very much an issue here. Wages are surprisingly moderate in this city. This is not a high-wage city. And uh, that, of course, adds to the affordability problem. Um, that's why, even though we don't have the highest prices in North America, this is the most unaffordable city in North America. A city like San Francisco, with higher prices, has much higher incomes. Um, <clears throat> so yes, uh, low wages. Uh, and this is true in many places, that uh, since the 2008 crash, wage growth has been minimal, while house prices have, because they've become an asset class, have, have gone through the roof. You see, this is what, I con what concerns me, yes. is that we've just had the unitary plan in Auckland, which, which just has been passed by the council. It's going through some legal processes. People object to it, but eventually it will become um, the plan. Yeah. And mostly they're saying the smart thing, the city has to grow up rather than out, yeah. along lines of existing infrastructure. My concern is, like, who's going to buy those houses? Mm -hmm. are, they, are we building houses for foreign buyers and, uh, and people who uh, want to speculate on yeah. housing rather than uh, building houses or apartments for people who really are in need of them? Well, the, the, the answer to that question is that uh, in a free market, that's exactly what builders will do because their profit margin is much greater if they're building at the upper end of the market, you know, what the market will bear. That's, that's where they want to be active. Uh, and there's very little incentive for them to build affordable housing. That's why it, it's very difficult to see a solution here that falls within the market paradigm. There, there has to be uh, a, an intervention of some kind. I wonder if broadly this has become a problem for neoliberalism, that it has come to the end of the road. There has to be government intervention and government regulation to the extent that um, die-hard neoliberals don't want. I'd say, uh, we, we've tested neoliberalism now for 30 years and it is quite clear that there is very significant pushback occurring. You, you look at Brexit, you look at Donald Trump, you look at the rise of right-wing parties in Europe, I mean the evidence is everywhere, that it, there are too many people who are being left behind by neoliberalism and governments rush to open markets wide and indeed to cut back the welfare state has just left those people out to dry and now they are reacting in ways which can in fact be counterproductive, not just to neoliberalism, but to society at large. So some correction is needed uh, and a recognition that the, the pendulum has swung much too far against the welfare state kind of society. And it, it needs to move back and find uh, a more sustainable location that is not only sustainable uh, economically, but sustainable socially and politically as well. See, I do wonder whether housing and the high prices of houses and the distance between wages and housing is in fact a litmus test um, of how neoliberalism is failing. Well, I mean, another word we can use here instead of affordability is inequality, because lack of affordability is lack of equality to the housing market. Mm -hmm. And there is now widespread recognition that what neoliberalism writ large, i.e. globalization, has done is certainly uh, reduced the inequality between countries, but has greatly increased the inequality within countries. Uh, and that's what we're seeing uh, in the housing market is, is, is a, a prime expression of that inequality. Another, of course, is in the labor market mm -hmm. with the 1% and the 99%. Uh, it's, it's the same, it's, it's another face of the same phenomenon. So what is Vancouver doing 
uh, for those people who can never afford a house, will not be able to afford a house, what's happening with people at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale? It's not just the lower end. It's, it's the, the people who are middle income as well. In fact, an alarming report was prepared by Van City, which is a, a credit savings uh, uh, organization, <coughs> a very reputable organization in town. A couple of years ago, they projected that in less than 10 years, GPs will not be able to enter the market here. Nurses, firefighters, those kinds of people. Uh, so we, I mean, the end game is, is, is very, very troubling and clearly something has to give. Now, I think we are seeing um, government finally recognizing that. We have had no national housing strategy in Canada since 1993. Federal government has been out of housing. They're now coming back, the Trudeau government. Uh, this right-wing government in British Columbia, which has been so one-dimensionally market, free market oriented, has now made this um, dramatic decision. The reason they've done it is because they read the opinion polls and there's an election next year um, to, with their 15% tax. And they promise that other measures are going to come at you know, appropriate intervals before the election. Um, so the, the, the trouble is the, you know, the, the level of collateral damage that has already occurred. There's a generational question, of course. Um, young people uh, are, are staying at home, are living in cramped and often uh, inadequate basement suites in houses. Um, they're moving further and further away, they're couch surfing, they're doubling up, you know, it's, it's a familiar litany. Um, and people are taking incredible debt loads to get into the market. We have the highest debt loads of any place in Canada, so that if interest rates rise or there's an economic downturn, this is going to be a very ugly scene here. Do you have any measures of the difference today in getting a house mm -hmm. for the average person than maybe, say, 10, 20 years ago? Unfortunately, I can't remember those statistics, but I've seen them, and uh, they're sort of similar to what you have expressed from your, your own opinion, uh, your, your own experience. Um, there is uh, a group here called Generation Squeeze that is emphasizing the generational issues of housing affordability, and they've produced some of those kinds of statistics that show the, the incredible, again, I'll use the word inequality of opportunity that exists today compared with a generation ago. I think one of the things that's a bit of a concern to me is that I'm beginning to see um, generational anger. Uh, yes. The young people are getting angry at the older generation. It's all your fault. Uh, mm -hmm. You created the property ladder. You are the greedy generation. Are you seeing any of that in Canada? Much less than I would have expected. Um, I'm looking in a research project at five cities, of which Vancouver is one. Um, Hong Kong is another. I do think some of the uh, umbrella movement and what followed it is related to youth being shut out. That, that is the most unequal city uh, in the world, I believe. Um, and uh, youth are being shut out. Obviously, democracy is an important issue, but so too is um, the failure to get onto the ladder the failure to get viable wages, because wages are flat there as well. Uh, there's been surprisingly little of that in Canada. Uh, I say surprising, it is surprising, because they've got an argument, and maybe this generation squeeze will sort of publicize and, and attract some uh, attention. Do students have to pay for university yes. in, in Canada yeah. as they do in New Zealand? Yeah. I mean, I come from a generation where I got a completely free education up to and including university. How was it for you? Yeah, well, in the UK, it was the same with me. Yes. Yeah. And that's connected, isn't it? Yes, all, that's all connected. Yeah, yes. I mean, so you, you, you leave university already in debt mm. and that debt load is getting greater. Mm. Fees are going up. Mm. Um, and so, yes, there's, there's a lot of room for generational anger. 
uh, and as I say, I'm, I'm quite surprised that there's been as much restraint as there has because the frustration, the anxiety, the anxiety of getting a job, a decent job, let alone uh, a place to live in a city like Vancouver or indeed Toronto, those are the... The other thing to mention here is that this is not happening in every city. One of the, one of the fascinating aspects of this... Uh, phenomenon of housing as asset, housing as uh, a destination for offshore capital, is that it is certain cities that are selected. I mean, the cities you mentioned earlier, uh, Vancouver, Auckland, Sydney, would be three of them, and we could probably add six or eight more. Um, but it's not happening <coughs> in Houston. Um, it's not happening in Winnipeg. Uh, so there's, there's an interesting geography to this uh, phenomenon as well. I mean, it is what I call the gateway cities, those cities in the country that are most open to movement of global capital and global labor. And by global labor, of course, I, I mean migrants. Look, this might be off the top of the head, but the cities are also harbour cities. They're near the sea. Um, has that got anything to do with it? Well, there, there is an argument, and this takes us back to supply. And, you know, it's an argument that certainly carries some weight here, that uh, we've got mountains, we've got ocean, we've got the U.S. border, we've got an agricultural land reserve. Of course, it restricts the amount of land that is available. Uh, that that cannot be ignored as a factor. I mean, I don't think we, we, we must make the case that this is all about offshore capital. There's, there's a convergence of factors. Cheap money, of course, is a major issue as well. Uh, cheap borrowing, cheap credit. But of course, that cheap credit is available throughout a country. Um, but uh, I, do, I do think that uh, land availability is certainly a factor here. So you've got an awful lot of credit slushing yeah. around. Yeah. And you've got a limited amount of land. Yeah. And I guess that's why the price goes up. Yes, for those, those selected cities that uh, are regarded as, uh, as trophy cities, you know, as asset cities, or a term that's used here as hedge cities cities to hedge your bets by parking your money there. I've heard of trophy wives, but trophy cities, this is a good one. <laughs> <laughs>